I titled this sermon, A Resurrection World. Now, as we begin, I think there's a disclaimer. I think there's something that we have to talk about whenever we speak about resurrection, because resurrection is not rational. The fact that we are all gathered here, sitting in seats this morning, talking about a dead man raised to life, it, it's kind of weird. It's kind of odd. It defies understanding. And my guess is you might be sitting here this morning. There's some of us here this morning. There's some skepticism. We're really going to talk about a dead man raised to life. Like that stuff just doesn't happen in the world. And so if that's you, well, that's okay. Uh, here's what I believe about resurrection. Resurrection, it's not a math problem to solve. Here's a math problem. A plus B equals C. A equals 7. C equals 9. What is B? I'm going to offer this. Oh, I see a few hands. Like, yeah, I know what B is. What is it? Two. All right. Good job. All right. Round of applause. <laughs> My guess is this has never changed someone's life. This has never transformed someone's life. This is a great math problem. Unless if you're a mathematician, then I guess maybe it has. Uh, but resurrection, it's not a math problem to solve. And I would also argue that it's not a religious problem to solve. Because here's the thing about religion, tradition, doctrine, rituals. They are good and they are helpful, but you know where they all lead you? They lead you to a truth to experience. There, there might be a doctrine that you hold. There's a tradition that you're a part of. There are certain rituals that we do. Like we, we sing songs, we go to church on a regular basis, we go to church on Easter, we go on Sundays, in a little while we'll celebrate communion, Eucharist together. They're good, but the purpose of doctrine, tradition, and rituals is to lead you someplace. They don't keep you there, stuck in your intellect. Rather, they lead you into an experience. Here's a question for us. Think about this for a moment. What has caused the most transformation in your life? When you think about your life and you look back over the years, there are probably certain moments that you could pinpoint and say, ooh, that moment was transformational. It was almost as if you experienced something and a season in your life ended. I remember when Reese was born, our first child, I couldn't fall asleep the night before I knew he was going to be born. We had a, a scheduled C-section, and the night before, it was, my goodness, my world is about to change forever. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There, there's a moment that you can look at, and you pinpoint it, and you say, because of this, something ended, and something new emerged. A math problem doesn't do that. Tradition, rituals, doctrine, they don't even do that. So when you think about these moments that have changed and transformed you, here's my guess about you, because I think you're like me. We're all human. We're all breathing. And there's some things that we have in common. There's some universal human truths. So here's what I believe about the moments that have transformed you. They're moments of pain that you've experienced. And maybe you didn't want to go through those moments, and they changed you. Sometimes in a good way. Sometimes th those moments of pain, they change you in a way where you're left trying to find your footing. The ground that you were standing on has shifted, and you're left trying to pick the pieces up. And sometimes it's weeks, it's months, until you actually can figure out exactly what has changed or how you can move forward from that experience. What else has changed you? Moments of joy elation, moments of loss, of love, heartache. What about moments of transcendence? Have you ever experienced this one before? When you realize how small you are, you realize how big the whole thing is, how big the universe is, and you think to yourself, oh my goodness, I thought I was so big and so great, but I'm, I'm actually... I am so small compared to how many people there are in the world, 
or how you stare up at the night sky and you see all those stars and you realize they're billions, millions, however trillions of light years away, and you think, oh my goodness, my life is fragile. <laughs> and sitting with that truth for a while changes things. It offers a new perspective. Or what about, have you ever been transformed? Have you ever been changed because of someone that you met? Someone that you look up to, mentor, and all of a sudden their way of living begins to rub off on you a little bit? Or you get into a relationship and you're changed a bit through your interactions with that person? Or sometimes people can change you in a really bad way. You ever have this one before? You're like, oh, they just bring out the worst in me. And the more that you spend time with that person, the more you find your life changing and you finally wake up one day and realize, why am I allowing that toxic person in my life? So the, the, the moments, my guess, that have changed you the most, they're right here. Common, universal, human moments and experiences that we all have. They're all up here universal, but your experiences are particular to you, but somehow they have changed you. They've changed the person that you are. And I would argue that this is exactly what we find in the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. So let's look at a story in the Bible, because I think that's a great place to talk about resurrection. If you have your Bible, you can turn to John chapter 21. Let me set the scene for you. Jesus has just died. It's what we reflected on Friday evening. Jesus has gone to the cross, he has died, and his disciples scatter. They disperse. John 21 takes place after the death, the crucifixion of Jesus. Where do we find his disciples? And we're not talking about the ones that are on the outer circle. We're talking about the all-star disciples. You know the ones I'm talking about, right? The ones who were really with Jesus, who were going to walk with Jesus wherever he went. And yet these all-star disciples, the best of the best, the ones that you would think would just have this unwavering, steady faith, they have gone home. They have returned to their lives before Jesus came and called them. I have a map for us because maps always clear things up. Here's a map of Israel. Notice, where is Jerusalem on this map? Do we see it? In the south, at the bottom. It's in that box right there. And uh, if you need your glasses or don't feel like pulling them out this morning, that box is magnified for you on your right-hand side. Jerusalem is all the way down at the bottom. This is where everything went down. This is where Jesus was crucified. By John 21, chapter after Jesus has died, where are the disciples? Anyone want to guess? They are up at the top. Do you see the Sea of Galilee? That is quite a journey. The disciples have gone home. They have returned to their lives. They are fishing on the Sea of Galilee because the whole movement, in their minds, it ended. It was over. To them, God did not act according to their religion. They had an idea, an understanding of how God was. They had their tradition. They had their religion. Yet God did not act according to their beliefs. God expanded their beliefs, and, and so they've given up. They're probably fishing. They're in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, probably asking themselves and each other, why, why did we do that for three years? Did we just waste three years of our lives? So while they're on this boat fishing in the Sea of Galilee, there is absolutely no expectation that God will ever act again in their lives. You ever been there before? You've gone through something. You had faith. It was strong faith. But then you had an experience. And God didn't act according to those beliefs that you held. So you've returned to a place of comfort. You've gone back to maybe how it was before. You've given up. You've lost hope. 
you find yourself fishing on a boat in the middle of the sea, wondering, why did I even believe any of that stuff anyway? And the spark that you once had for God, for God being an active living force in your life and the world, it's gone dim. And it's gone. This is where we pick up the story. Complete hopelessness. Which I know, that's not what you come to Resurrection Sunday to talk about. I get it. Don't worry. We're going to move beyond this point. Let's just sit in the hopelessness for a moment. How's that? That's why you come to church, right? (laughs) Early in the morning, while they're on the boat, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. Why? Because they had absolutely no expectation that God would ever do anything again. Jesus was dead and gone along with their faith and those three years that they had invested. Jesus called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Which at this point, if you're fishing on a boat, you're already depressed. And now you have some smart aleck on the shore like, hey guys, friends out there. You guys catch any fish? What's your mood going to be like? (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to get this. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to row to the shore and I'm going to show, I'm going to make this guy eat dirt. Yeah, you're not having any of it. No, they answered. <laughs> to which Jesus replied, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you're going to find some. You think they're going to be like, okay, yeah. What, what is this guy talking about? First, he's calling out the fact that we haven't caught any fish. Now he's telling us how to fish. When they did that, because I guess when you're already low, you got nowhere else to go. So they're like, well, we might as well listen to this guy. They were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, I love it, the guy who's writing it, the disciple whom Jesus loved, like me, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, and I, you have to love Simon Peter. This guy is brash. He's impulsive. He's reactive. He wears all of his emotions. You know exactly how the guy is feeling. You'll have a friend like this, right? Like you know if the person's happy or if they're sad, if they're depressed. You know exactly what they're going through and how they're feeling. This is Simon Peter, and you all have a Simon Peter in your life. It is the Lord. And so he wrapped his outer garment around him. And I love this little parentheses right here for he had taken it off as if we really need to know that thank you john he jumped into the water the other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore about a hundred yards when they landed they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread jesus said to them bring some of the fish you've just caught So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 fish to be exact, but who's counting? But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Let's have a feast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. What a weird story. Question for us. What rekindled faith, hope, and joy for the disciples? Who was paying attention this morning? Maybe a little trickier than the math problem from before? We read this story. They're depressed. No hope. But what rekindled that hope in their lives? It wasn't doctrine. It wasn't a Bible verse. Breakfast, which, come on, I mean, for all of us here, does breakfast not rekindle hope? It was an experience. It was presence, the presence of Jesus. It was a meal, a shared meal together on the shore. And now here's where we come to a truth at the heart of resurrection. The story continues. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He's like, come on, you, I've already answered it twice. Do you really need to know a third time? He said, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Three times. Do you love me? Now let's think about this story here for a second. Why might Jesus have asked him three different, like why wouldn't one answer suffice? Do you love me? Great. Okay, feed my sheep. Move on to the next part of the conversation. But Jesus stays stuck, stuck there. Last time, if you're familiar with the story, last time that Peter saw Jesus, do we know what was happening? Peter was denying Jesus. I, I don't know the guy. Never seen him before. How many times did he deny Jesus? Three times. No, I don't know him. Never seen him. I'm not with him. I'm not one of his followers. You might have seen me there, but you know, I was just trying to see what the guy was talking about, but I, I really, I, I don't trust him. I don't, I don't follow him with my life. Now, fast forward in the story to the scene where we are on the beach. What do you think might be going through Peter's mind when he sees Jesus now in this moment? What about some of these? Humiliation, embarrassment, regret, shame. What about feelings of inadequacy? Man, the last time I saw Jesus, man, he, he was looking right at me when I denied him, and now here he is right now. I, I never expected to see him again. I never expected that he would make it off the cross, that he would be resurrected. That's not how the whole thing works. Now there's these feelings of embarrassment and shame running through Peter, and yet here comes Jesus three times. It's almost as if he's saying, hey, Peter, I forgive those moments of weakness. You ever been there before in a moment of weakness? You look back over something you've done and you think, oh, I have so much regret over that decision. I mean, you know exactly what it's like to be Peter. And yet here comes Jesus. Those moments of weakness that you carry with you, that you hold over yourself, they're forgiven. Or what about this one? I'm healing your shame. Anyone here ever experienced some shame? in their life, and you could use some healing from that shame. It's haunted you ever since that moment you carry it with you. The words of Jesus, the shame, I'm healing it. Or what about this one? I'm restoring you. Anyone here this morning and you are in need of restoration? You had this dream Maybe it was a belief and it's all been shattered. It feels like your life has fallen apart. The words of Jesus, the words to Peter, the words to you, to all of us, I'm restoring your life. Anyone need to hear that this morning? See, at the heart of resurrection is a forgiveness that heals our shame and restores our truest self. When we look at the stories of resurrection, the way in which the New Testament writers spoke about resurrection, it was always connected to forgiveness and the possibility for a new life, a new way of moving forward. Think about the disciples. They had just run into a wall. They were staring at a dead end, and now Jesus comes and opens up a whole new world for them. At the heart of resurrection is forgiveness and the possibility of a new way of being. Here are three truths I want to offer to you about forgiveness. First, forgiveness removes shameful feelings of being broken or disqualified. Think about Peter on the shore. He was a fisherman. Jesus had offered him this compelling vision for his life. And yet now Peter had shrunk that vision. Because with Jesus' death, so had gone that vision for Peter's life. Jesus had offered a huge vision for what Peter could accomplish with his life. But now when Jesus had died, Peter took that vision and he threw it away. 
And yet here comes Jesus, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. The calling that I had placed on your life years ago, the calling that you felt in your bones, that fire that you felt within you that you thought was long dead and gone, I am reigniting that spark. I want to show you a picture of uh, some of the greenery around our home. We're starting to get there. We're not quite there yet. I understand. We're still in early spring. Uh, here is our forsythia bush. Now, what you'll notice is towards the back, the upper portion of that picture, it's pretty yellow, and it's standing upright. And then we have this poor little bush right here. I don't know exactly what happened. I don't know if the snow was too heavy on it. Deer like to hang out in our yard. I don't know if some deer decided to take a nap on this forsythia bush. No matter what, this thing is broken. It's cracked. We had someone who was doing some tree work at our house. He looked at it. He said, there is no way this thing is going to blossom. The deer, the snow, whatever, the elements, your neighbor, a giant cat, I don't know what. Something came and snapped some of these branches. Yet if you look a little closer at this forsythia bush, you'll notice it still has life in it. Here's a so-called expert saying this thing is dead. This thing is broken. But now as spring has erupted into our world, this poor, broken forsythia bush is sprouting life. Maybe you're here this morning, and because of where you've been, because of what you've done, you feel as if your life is broken. You feel a bit disqualified. Maybe there used to be this vision that you had for who you could be, what you could offer with your life, but because of your experiences, you've squelched that vision. You've shrunk it down. But yet, just like this forsythia bush, you still have life in you. You're not broken. You're not disqualified from the calling that God has placed on your life. See, forg forgiveness proclaims your life still has much to offer. Jesus resurrected the calling on Peter's life. You thought this was no more, but in reality, it's still there. This calling is still for you, and you can still step into it. Second truth of resurrection, forgiveness heals our pain. Now, I'm reading a story about Russia, and I want to read for you a little snippet of this book. Historical fiction, one of my all-time favorite genres to read. Shame, pain, you know what it does? It causes us to act out in harmful, destructive ways. Here's a little story. This takes place uh, in the 1800s. Ruska by Edward Rutherford. Anyone ever read this book before? Okay, go home, finish it by tonight or next week. We'll talk about it next Sunday. Now here's a story. And there is this lord. There is someone who owns land named Alexander. And he has two serfs on his land. And the serfs are coming to him because they want him to do something. They're going to pay him some money so that they can go and they can visit Moscow because that's the way it worked. If you wanted to go to another part of the country, you had to pay your landlord so that you could leave the land that you were working for them. So why was it that their entry, the entry of Alexander the landlord's wife and children, should have caused him to change his price? He was thinking one price. Now his wife and kids come in and here's what happens. Was it? Did he change? Did he raise the price? Was it a sudden memory of his humiliation at Sergei's birth? See, what had happened was when his son was born, he knew that it wasn't his son because while he was in prison, his wife had had an affair. So this son was a source of pain and humiliation for him. So was he being reminded of this humiliating situation? And when he saw them come in the room, did he exact a higher price for his serfs because he was humiliated by their presence? Or was it a sense of his failure at his career and his wife's success at running the estate when he was in prison? Was he being reminded of his failure? When we are reminded of moments in which we've been humiliated, moments of pain, moments of our failure, 
We protect ourselves by lashing out at others. I mean, the author, he understands the human condition right here. The landlord now says it's going to be double the price because he's thinking about his pain. And that's what happens. When our pain isn't healed, we begin causing pain for others because in, in a way we feel good about ourselves. We were humiliated. We were hurt. Now I am going to cause that same pain and humiliation to others. That's what happens. And so forgiveness heals that pain. It heals the shame so that we do not continue passing our pain on to others. There's this famous saying, hurt people hurt people. And it's true. When we carry our hurt, when it's not healed, in moments in which we're reminded of it, we then lash out and cause hurt and pain to others. We pass death along to other people. The serfs, when they heard about this price, the younger son said, I will fight this landlord to the death eventually when I get my chance. Perpetuating a cycle of death. And then a third truth about resurrection and forgiveness. Forgiveness offers us a chance to reflect and be honest with the sinful, harmful ways we've been creating the opposite of a resurrection world. The story continues. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself, you went where you wanted. When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands, someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to Peter, follow me. John begins his gospel with the invitation, follow me. He ends his gospel with the invitation, follow me. Follow comes from two Greek words, a, which is just a prefix, so it's not really a word. But then here's the main word in follow, kaluthos, which means road. In the Bible, from the very beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, The Bible is constantly saying there are two roads before you. There's a road to life and there's a road to death. When Jesus says, follow me, he is offering an invitation to walk the road of life. If you follow me, you will find life. If you trust me and follow my ways, my way of being, you will not walk the road of death but rather you will find life as you put into practice my way of being. The invitation Jesus has for Peter, after he has given, after he has reinstated, restored him, is walk my path. Accompany me. As you do so, you will find life for your soul. And others will find life through the path that you are walking forgiveness, grace, it offers us this continual opportunity to ask ourselves, what road am I walking? My actions, the way in which I'm living, is it producing life within me or is it producing death? Forgiveness is an opportunity for us to ask ourselves, are there any ways in which the road I'm walking is leading to death? And if so, I need to set those aside. I need to acknowledge them and begin walking a new path, a different path than the one in which I'm walking. Story ends right here. Peter turned, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? Peter saw him. He asked, Lord, what about him? What about this guy? I love this right here. He's comparing himself. He's like, well, you you just sold me a vision for my life, and some of it's good, some of it's bad, but what about this guy over here? What's going to be his path? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive, who cares? What is that to you? And then what does Jesus, Jesus say again to Peter? You must follow me. This is the invitation for us this Resurrection Sunday. Jesus speaking these words, I have a road, I have a path, and it leads to life. It's a road that leads to goodness and to love, to mercy, 
If you walk this path, you will find life. The world will find life through you. We have an opportunity this morning in every moment to walk the path of Jesus and find life. What we find in the story of Peter is that forgiveness, grace, love, that's what heals. That's what transforms. We're going to celebrate Eucharist. This ancient ritual followers of Jesus have been celebrating for 2,000 years. It's an opportunity for us to come forward to remember the death, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus that produces life for us and for this world. As we come forward, the question before us, is there any hurt that we've been carrying and we need to lay it down because it hasn't been serving us well and we've been passing death on to others. So is there any hurt that needs to be healed this morning? Or is there any way in which we've been walking a road and if we're being honest, that road isn't leading to life. It's actually leading to a death. And we need to change. We need to follow and walk a different path. This is an opportunity for us to reflect on the road that we're walking. So as you come forward, take the bread, take the cup, and may you experience the presence, the forgiveness, the healing, the meal of Jesus.